Hi everybody, this is the second lecture video. Thanks again for watching them. As I said before, watching these videos is really essential for this new course format. So thanks for doing that. Today I'm going to talk about omics, which is another word for sequencing technologies. And I don't want this course to be very technique heavy. It's not a course that's um, completely dedicated to genomics and metagenomics. Um, but a lot of the papers we're going to discuss in class and just the concepts of modern microbiology require a, a basic understanding of how DNA sequencing works nowadays. And so today I'm going to try to get you up to speed on that and hopefully demystify some of these ideas um, about DNA sequencing methods just enough that it hopefully it won't scare you away from, from reading papers that you would otherwise like to read. The first concept I want to get across is that the so-called central dogma of biology, of DNA um, encoding information that is transcribed into RNA, that is translated into amino acids and proteins, is the also the essential idea for understanding um, modern molecular sequencing technologies. Uh, and so, so we'll we'll talk about that um, first. I want to explain that um, we have DNA and RNA and protein sequencing technologies to thank for our modern understanding of microbiology. As I mentioned in the previous video, um, until these technologies came around, the only way that we could discover new species and characterize them was to grow them in the lab. And so, if you couldn't grow a species in the lab, you couldn't grow it on a petri plate or in a in a in a media tube like this, then we just didn't know it existed. I mean, you could look at it under a microscope, but they just look like dots under the microscope for the most part. Um, that's, a, that's a bit of a simplification, but it, we really didn't have an appreciation for the vast diversity of microbes until we could sequence their DNA and RNA and protein. And so with this concept of the central dogma, um, it can help explain a lot of the jargon um, related to these technologies. So when we're talking about DNA, we're talking about one gene or a whole genome that is composed of multiple genes, that these are all words um, that um, refer to DNA sequences. Um, and the first genome sequence we had was in 1995. Mm. Um, uh, when we're talking about RNA, we're talking about uh, transcripts, an individual transcript from an individual gene. Or if we're talking about all of the transcripts from an organism or from an environment, then we're talking about a transcriptome, um, which is analogous to a genome. But instead of all of the genes, we're talking about all of the transcripts, all of the RNA transcripts, mRNA, messenger RNA. And so for amino acids, we've got an individual protein that comes from an individual gene. And um, the collection of all of the proteins from an organism is called a proteome, right? So that's where the omics comes from, genome, transcript ohm, proteome. The ohm means the collection of all such things. When we're using DNA, we can talk about genetic potential. That is the information that is encoded. When we're talking about RNA sequences, we're talking about genetic expression. That means the genes are actually being expressed. Just because you have a DNA sequence does not mean that that, DNA, does not mean that, that gene is actually active. Um, and if you want to know if that gene is expressed into an mRNA transcript, you need to sequence the mRNA transcripts. And then metabolic activity happens with proteins. So even if you have an mRNA transcript, you don't know if that transcript ever actually makes it into a protein. There are many layers of regulation that sometimes um, prevent a transcript from ever making it into a functional protein and a functional enzyme. And so... Um, um, in some studies, you really need to st sequence the proteome or individual proteins if you want to understand the metabolic activity that is actually occurring, rather than the metabolic activity that has the potential to occur, which is what you get with the DNA. Okay, DNA, RNA, protein, three different molecules, that all of which we can sequence, and we will read papers that sequence one or all of them. Now, um, if we... We talk about um, sequences from an environmental sample rather than from an individual organism. So that's what I am referring to with these images. So here we're sequencing genes or genomes from an individual organism or an individual species that we've grown in the lab. We can do all this um, with things that we grow in the lab. But if we just take a bucket of water from the ocean or from a lake, or if we take a scoop of soil or a scoop of sediment from the ocean, 
or a scoop of gunky biofilm from a pipe. Um, then we sequence the DNA or the RNA or the amino acids directly from that sample without any growing in the lab of an individual species. You just literally sequence the DNA molecules in that water or in that soil. Then you have a metagenome, right? So all of the genomes from that sample is what the metagenome refers to. Um, and for um, comparison, we had the first genome in 1995 and we had the first metagenome in about 2004. Um, followed closely by the first metatranscriptome in 2005, which is the first time people sequenced all of the mRNA molecules from an environmental sample without culturing it in the lab first. And then the first metaproteome, uh, which would be all of the protein sequences from an environmental sample, that was done also in 2005. And nowadays, depending on the goals and resources available to your project, you might do one or all of these. So again, the meta um, is referring to that it's coming from an environmental sample and therefore it includes all of the species or a big subset of all of the species in that sample, not just a single species. And that is what we will talk about a lot in this course because it's about environmental microbes, it's about natural communities, not individual species. So we're gonna talk a lot about metagenomes, especially and also metatranscriptomes and metaproteomes. So let's focus first on the DNA portion of this and and divide that up into um, at least two different subcategories within the DNA. That's most of the papers we talk about will we'll only be sequencing DNA. That's usually the first thing you do in a study and then later on you add RNA and protein if you have the resources. <clears throat> and the, the, the two main categories with DNA sequencing is whether you're gonna sequence one gene or all of the genes. So if you're sequencing one gene um, then you're choosing one gene that you think is especially informative for um, measuring the diversity of your environmental sample. And almost always in microbiology, we choose the small subunit of the ribosome, exactly the same gene that Carl Woese chose um, that I talked about in the previous lecture. Um, not only because that's the one that Carl Woese chose, so it was the first one that we had a lot of information on, and so it always made sense to continue building on our databases, of the small subunit of the ribosome. Another name for the small subunit of the ribosome is the 16S ribosomal RNA. So we, we will usually actually call the 16S sequencing. For historical reasons, the small subunit is called 16S. The large subunit is called 23S. Um, so 16S sequencing means sequencing of the small subunit of the ribosome. Mm. Um, and this tells you who is there. Um, it, this is a good way of getting a list of all of the species that were present in that sample. It doesn't tell you anything else. It doesn't tell you what metabolic pathways it has. It doesn't tell you if it has a gene for this or a gene for that. It just gives you uh, a marker for assigning a species name to an individual sequence, which can be super, super useful because you can relate that to lots of other things, but, th but that's all it gives you. And so if you want information about all of the other genes that are present in the genomes of the organisms in that environment, then that is true metagenomic sequencing, where you're sequencing all of the genes from all of the genomes from all of the organisms in your environmental sample. And that is when you could start asking, what is the metabolic potential? What are these organisms potentially capable of doing? And as we mentioned before, the RNA and the protein sequences will help us answer what are they actually doing? So with the DNA, we can ask what are they potentially doing? And even if we only sequence one gene, um, we can ask who is there. Sometimes I see people, sorry, talk about a single gene sequencing study, for example, a 16S sequencing study as metagenomics, if it is coming from an environmental sample. But I prefer to re reserve the word metagenomics for the idea of sequencing all of the genes from all of the genomes. And for a single gene study, I call that amplicon sequencing because um, in order to do that, you have to do a PCR experiment to amplify um, um, a region of a single gene. And the product of that amplification, sorry, is called an amplicon. <clears throat> so I call that amplicon sequencing or you can call it marker sequencing. Some people call it barcoding, um, but I, and some people call it targeted metagenomics to um, distinguish it from truly um, a whole random metagenomics. But I, I prefer to only use the word metagenomics for, clar for clarity 
to refer to the fact when we're doing all of the genomes because all of the genes in a genome because it has the word genomic in it. And I think it's funny to use a term with the word genomic in it if we're only talking about a single gene. Okay, so those are the two categories, amplicon sequencing for a single gene, metagenomic sequencing for all the genes. And also in this figure, I'm highlighting that you have an inherent tension between these two strategies, whereas with a single gene with the same amount of money, the same amount of resources, you can sequence that one gene many, many, many thousands or even millions of times in a single study for the same cost as it would take to sequence all of the genes and all of the genomes at a much lower depth. Depth is a technical term for the number of times you sequence the same position of the genome. And so I've intentionally drawn this figure to highlight that typically in a 16S sequencing study, you get thousands or millions of copies of the 16S gene, so potentially thousands or millions of species in the single study. With a metagenomic study, you get many fewer um, individuals captured by your sequencing study for the same cost, but you get their whole genomes because you're spreading that sequencing effort over the whole genome instead of concentrating all of your sequencing budget on a single gene. So hopefully that's an intuitive concept and we'll talk about it a lot in the future. Mm. Often when we do 16S sequencing studies, that is sequencing a single taxonomic marker gene, um, the output of that in the published paper is a phylogenetic tree. And a lot of people really do not like phylogenetic trees. They tend to be very ugly figures and not very much fun to look at, especially if you don't care about microbial taxonomy and then it's full of a bunch of Latin names that you don't know anything about. And so I want to spend a few minutes to explain why we make these phylogenetic trees, even though most people hate them. Microbiologists included often hate these trees, but they're really, really useful. So I want to explain why they're so useful. So first of all, in order to make a phylogenetic tree, you um, need to make an alignment. So alignment is um, a uh, sorting and ordering of your sequences in such a way that each position of the alignment is homologous. Um, so that's a concept from evolutionary biology that if you wanna compare things in an evolutionary framework, you need to compare homologous traits. And in a sequence, uh, context, a trait is actually a position in the genome. So here I have aligned my 16S sequences. This is real data from, from one of my projects. Um, and you can see that all of the individual sequences, so we have multiple individual sequences going from top to bottom here, are identical over the first several bases until the first difference I see here is at this position here, where the first two sequences have a G and the other sequences have a T in this position. And because all of these sequences are identical, it's very easy to convince ourselves that these positions are all homologous that these are all, in fact, the equivalent positions in their respective genomes. Um, and here we have a difference in this position. It's still homologous. It's still the equivalent position in each of their genomes, but it's a difference. So there, you could say that there's a mutation in here compared to here. And as we go along, you can see multiple examples of mutations. We have vari or variants in these homologous positions. It's not always clear how to decide which positions are homologous or not. This one is pretty easy because there's so little variation. They're mostly identical. But you can imagine um, if your region that you're sequencing is highly variable, it might be a lot harder to line them up so that you are sure that everything is correctly aligned and that you're actually comparing homologous positions to each other. That's just a research challenge we often have and there is no easy way to solve it. There are computer programs out there that can help, but there's often not a clear answer of how to do that. 16S though, one reason that we use the 16S gene for the sequencing is that it is generally really easy to align and really easy to convince ourselves of which positions are homologous and which are not. And that is because it is very well conserved, which is to say that it's ancient, it is very slowly evolving, and you can see similarities in 16S genes from very, very different species, all the way from microbes to humans, for example. Also, just want to point out that in a typical study, you usually have millions of these sequences, not just 10 or so. So this is just a small subset. You usually have millions of sequences, and usually the length of the sequence is about 500 bases long or so, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer. The whole gene is about 1,500 bases, and generally with the sequencing study, we, we sequence about a 500 base pair region. Okay, so that was my very fast uh, overview of 16S sequencing.
um, and how you work with the data. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about very briefly what kind of data, what kind of things you can do with metagenomic data when you're sequencing all of the genes. And often, instead of phylogenetic trees, we sort these results and um, categorize them according to predicted function. So the, the basic thing you do with metagenomic data is that you take all of those predicted genes and you predict what the function is of each gene. And what that is basically is just a bunch of searching against databases. And you try to find genes that are already in public databases that are similar enough to your new gene that you've just sequenced. And if it's similar enough, then you basically just um, uh, assign the function of the gene in the database to your new gene. So if your new gene is sufficiently similar to genes that we already know are involved in photosynthesis, then you can make a figure saying how many predicted photosynthesis genes you have. When we write these papers, we have tried to be careful to say that these are always predicted functions. Of all, if all we've done is sequence DNA, we, we haven't actually shown a function. We've really predicted a function. And if the paper is written carefully enough, it, that should be clear that these are all predicted functions. You don't actually know the function until you do the experiment in the lab. Okay, so you might find uh, tables or pie charts or bar charts showing how many genes you have in this function or how many genes you have in that function. And here are a bunch of examples. And a very important category here is unknown because um, at least half, um, sometimes the, the vast majority of genes in a metagenomic study have no similarity to any other genes in public databases, and therefore they have an unknown function. Or they are very similar to other genes in the public database which don't have a function. So there are two different ways to be an unknown. It could be completely new, has no similarity to anything in a database, or it could be similar or even identical to other things in the database, but those things in the database themselves don't have any known function. So that those are two different kinds of, of unknowns. <clears throat> Again, I'm not gonna dig deep into the, the weeds of how these technologies work. This is not a lab course, it's not a technology course, and also the technology is constantly changing. Um, so right now I just want to use some to, to mention some of the jargon here um, and, and to talk a little bit about just how um, useful this technology has been. So compared to the, the sequencing technology that I was using as an undergraduate student or even early in my graduate student career, this technology is generating 10,000 times more sequence for the same price. And nowadays that's, I don't know what it is, it's like 100,000 or a million or multiple millions of times more data for the same dollar as we did even in my, even compared to the beginning of my career. So not only my lifetime, but, but my career, this has changed. So it's really been a super exciting time to be a microbiologist. Um, but it's also changing all the time. And the companies that make these machines are changing all the time. Um, when I was a grad student, 454 was the latest and greatest. Now people don't even know what that is. Um, Lumina has been the leader in this area for a long, long time. Um, um, and the Illumina machines are still the most commonly used today. And almost all of my projects involve Illumina data. Um, uh, and then there are some other companies out there as well. Nanopore. Um, has been uh, um, an up-and-comer for a long time and is now finally actually producing really nice data. Um, and in other courses, you, you can learn about how these technologies work. And as they come up during this course, I will, I will explain how they work as needed. Uh, here's a, um, a really uh, common graph that one uh, sees in this, on this topic, um, comparing the cost of sequencing a megabase, which is a million bases of DNA sequence, so it's just showing what I already mentioned before, that the cost has dropped dramatically from the early 2000s. It could take thousands of dollars to sequence a, a genome, basically. A megabase is maybe a one-fifth of an E. coli genome. Um, and then around the mid-2000s and in the past few years, this slide is a bit out of date now, the cost has dropped to um, fractions of a, uh, of a dollar, or now I think it's even fractions of a cent to sequence a million bases. And this graph in particular is being compared to Moore's law, which if you know about um, computer technology, is a law that for a long time was uh, describing the um, decreasing cost of uh, manufacturing the same amount of computational power. 
or another way to put it is the increasing speed of computer processors over time, which um, especially in the early 2000s, the computer scientists were very proud of themselves of how much progress they were making in that. And so this is to show that the DNA sequencing technology is way, way, way more impressive um, over this time period, at least, than the improvement in, in computer processors. Um, this also means that our ability to generate DNA data um, is much, much greater now than is our ability to actually analyze that data. So there's this so-called problem that biology now has too much data and we lack the resources, not only the computational resources, but also the human resources to actually analyze all that data. So it's very common for um, a, a funded project to generate a bunch of data and then um, the people running the project are like, okay, now what do we do with all this data? We don't have uh, computers fast enough or big enough to handle the data, and we also don't have students who are trained in how to analyze the data. Um, so this is exciting um, and also a challenge for um, developing techniques and also for developing students to, to train them to, to work with all this data that we're generating now. Um, okay, so so let's get to the science. Like, why is this technology actually useful for making scientific discoveries? I think that's an, an important question. Generating data is all well and good, but um, is there actually important science that we can do? So this is what this whole course is about, so I'm not gonna answer that question entirely, but just to give you two examples of the kinds of questions that we can address with these two different kinds of DNA sequencing, 16S amplicon sequencing and metagenomic sequencing, those are addressing two fundamentally different questions. The one would be how many species are on Earth, which is like an ecological diversity question. And then metagenomic sequencing helps us ask how many different genes are on Earth and what are they doing, which is more of a genomics and a biochemistry question. So two very quick examples of what I mean by that. Um, so this graph is showing the number of organisms on the x-axis and the phylogenetic diversity on the y-axis. So this is showing, um, <clears throat> for example, the, the blue curve is showing the number of species and the number of individual entries in the database, which is the x-axis, the number of organisms that were grown in the lab, like on petri plates or in liquid broth, um, had their DNA sequenced and extracted and their, and their genome sequenced and assembled. And that's on the order of, you know, thousands of individual genomes that represent maybe a, a couple of hundred species. Um, this was in 2013, so it's a bit out of date now, but the, the concept still holds today. Now, for a relatively small number of individuals and relatively small number of species, we can grow them in the lab and sequence their genomes. Okay. Now, what this is showing is this dark gray curve is the number of species that have been grown in the lab by 2013, but we hadn't yet sequenced their genomes. So representing fewer than a thousand species and a, um, a few um, 20 or 30,000 individual individuals. We, we grew them in the lab, but we hadn't sequenced their genomes yet. Um, now in 2022, this gray curve is very similar to the blue curve because nowadays we can sequence genomes faster than we can grow them in the lab. Um, so that, that's the only real difference in this curve um, com compared to today. But what is not any different today, and perhaps is even worse today, is this light gray curve, which is the number of species that we had detected, but we had not grown in the lab or sequenced their genomes. And so this, another way of saying this is that this is the number of individuals um, and the number of species they represent that we had detected with 16S sequencing, but that was the only thing we knew about them. We knew that they were there. We could sequence one chunk of their 16S sequence, so they were real. Um, and there were other experiments to show that if you have a 16S sequence, that does in fact mean that it's real and that it's a real species. Um, that was a valid question 10 or 15 years ago, but now we know that you know, 16S sequences are, um, are, are, are good at representing the, the real diversity in the environment, but they hadn't been grown in the lab and we hadn't sequenced their genome. Now we can actually sequence genomes of organisms directly from the environment, that is metagenomic assembly, but that was a relatively new concept when, when this graph was made. Um, okay, so this is how we can use 16S sequencing to ask how many species are there on Earth? And the answer to that is actually, uh, we don't know, because this curve um, 
uh, might seem like it's slightly asymptotic, but in reality, it is going to infinity. There is no constraint on how high this curve can go. Um, right now, the number of species we've detected with 16S sequencing is easily in the hundreds of thousands and maybe in the millions of species, depending on what your definition of species is. And definitions of species is something that we will talk about later in the course. Um, but there is no constraint on how many species there might be out there. It could be millions, it could be billions, it could be trillions. We, re we literally have no constraint. It might as well be infinity at this point. Okay, so that is one kind of quasi answer to the question, how many species are there on Earth? Maybe infinite? We we're not really sure. It's a very large number. Uh, and then the second question, how many different genes are there on Earth? Which is a slightly different question, right? Um, this is not so much about diversity of species, but diversity of genes, like um, how many different kinds of metabolic pathways and cellular functions are there? And for that, you might expect a very much smaller number because you probably learned at some point in biology that the basic biochemical functions of bacteria and archaea are not very different from the basic biochemical functions of eukaryotes, even humans. Uh, we use the same central metabolic pathways that E. coli uses, right? Um, which is why biochemistry is such an important class to take. Uh, and so you may not expect that a metagenomic sequencing experiment would necessarily detect that many new kinds of genes than, for example, just sequencing a bunch of mammals. Uh, but in fact, you do. So um, this curve, this is a really old curve, but I like it so much and I haven't been able to find one that's more up to date that, that still shows it in such a dramatic way. But this is the number of clusters of proteins, which is just a kind of a really rough way of um, calculating kinds of genes. So you, you, you cluster the genes into groups um, and then the number of different groups of genes is, 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 is like counting the number of kinds of genes. Okay, so if you sequence all of the mammal genomes that we had in 2007, and I don't think this number is very different now because mammals are basically all the same, as you're starting to see with this curve, that um, uh, as you sequence more and more genes from mammals, the number of kinds of genes you get flattens out because mammals are all the same. They all have the same metabolic pathways. Like mammals are really interestingly different in their morphology and their anatomy and their behavior, obviously. But in terms of genes, they're, they're all basically the same. There's not a lot of genetic um, innovation going on in the mammals. Okay? They're, they're way too young for that. With the microbes, though, this is one of the very first metagenomic sequencing studies published in 2007. And this is just their one study, I think. I forget the difference between the red and the green curves, but I think this is just from one study they did in the ocean. And they had already found many more kinds of genes um, in their one metagenomic study than had ever been found in sequencing all of the mammalian genomes. So this is one way of showing that microbes that we detect with metagenomic studies have many, many different kinds of genes than we had ever seen before by, by studying typical um, organisms in the lab. Okay, so even if you don't care about ecological diversity and numbers of species, if you care about genes at all and, and biochemical functions, the metagenomic studies are a great way of discovering uh, brand new functions um, um, of molecules in general. Okay, so now, um, uh, transitioning a little bit into a little bit of a more practical tutorial. And this part of the lecture is probably best done in person. Um, so if you get to this part of the video and you're running out of time, it's okay to pause it and we'll go over this in person. Um, but if you do have the time, I'll, I will give a bit of an intro um, that might make our in-person discussion of this topic um, more efficient. Okay. So with 16S sequencing, I said it's a good way to count how many species there are. So how would you actually do that? So um, here are three sequences. I've highlighted the mutational differences between the three sequences. These are the variants at these yellow positions. Um, again, we usually have thousands or millions of these sequences, but on one slide, I'm going to use three sequences. Um, we can say that these are different enough to be considered different species. Um, the term that we often use for this is Operational Taxonomic Unit, or OTU, which is a cluster of sequences that we consider to be different species. It's just a way of getting around using the word species, which is a very loaded term um, that gets you into all sorts of debates. So we invented this 
funny word that basically means the same thing as species without requiring you to adopt a specific definition of a species in any kind of theoretical way. So these are clusters of sequences that probably represent different species. Um, and then if we count how many times each of these different sequences occurs in our different samples, so these could be um, different spots in our um, agricultural soil, uh, you know, different agricultural plots, or it could be different depths in the ocean, or it could be different locations in the ocean, or it could be different time points, like February, March, April, and May of our site that we're studying over time. It could be different um, human individuals, um, human one, human two, human three, that we've sampled their fecal microbiome, or it could be the same human uh, sampled over time, right? This could be, it could be anything but it's important that these are whole environmental samples of water or soil or fecal samples or whatever. And so we count how many times does the sequence occur in each of these samples that we have sequenced separately. So we do a sequencing study of the sample and a sequencing study of the sample and so on. And I made up some fake numbers um, that this species occurs so many times in each of these samples and species two occurs so many times in each of these samples and so on. This um, is the fundamental concept, perhaps, of this entire course. Almost every single study, every single paper that we will talk about um, at its base has some kind of version of this species abundance table. This is also one of the most fundamental ideas in all of ecology. It's not specific to microbial ecology. If you're going out into a rainforest and counting bird species as a birder, then you'll make exactly the same kind of table. You'll count how many times you saw bird species one at this location, how many times you saw that bird species in the second location. Um, do the same thing for other species, right? These, these are species counts. That's all they are. They're just that we are doing our species counts with sequences of a particular gene rather than by going out and, and counting birds with binoculars or listening to their calls. Okay, once we have the species abundance table, then we can use all of the ecological statistics that all other ecologists have access to as well. So the same statistics that bird ecologists or tree ecologists or, or worm ecologists use, we can use as well for microbes. And there are two basic kinds of diversity calculations that we can make. There's alpha diversity, which is how many species are in each sample. That is, um, sample one clearly has three species, sample two has three species, sample three has three species. These three species occur in all these samples, and so they basically all have the same alpha diversity. They all have the same number of species. Okay? Beta diversity is which species are shared among the samples. So not just counting the number of species in one sample, but asking, does this species occur in all of the samples, or does it only occur in some of the samples? So it's thinking more about the distribution of the species rather than only the number of different species in a single sample. All right. And um, whereas with alpha diversity, the result is basically a single number, right? Three, for example. Beta diversity is much more complicated because you're making comparisons. You're, you're comparing samples to each other. And so the result is usually a matrix or, or, or fancy multivariate plots. Right? It's a much more complicated result that you have to plot. And we're going to go over many, many examples of this. So you don't, I'm not expecting you to fully understand this now. This is just the first step in kind of grappling with this concept of alpha diversity and beta diversity. And I expect you to come back to the slide many, many times during this course to, to try to remind yourself. Okay, so here's another example. This is a separate example. This is not the same one as before. Um, and uh, this, this is a new example. Um, we have three different environmental samples. Again, these could be different locations, different times, or different human patients. And here I've listed many more species. We have 14 different species. And here I just have ones and zeros for presence and absence. So species A is present in sample one and three, but not in sample two. Okay, and so on. So what is the alpha diversity of each sample? So the alpha diversity is just the number of species in each sample. So here, <laughs> The alpha diversity of sample one is eight because it has eight species. The alpha diversity of sample two is also eight because it also has eight species. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The alpha diversity of sample three is four because it only has four species, right? That's alpha diversity. Really, really simple. 
it doesn't in reality it's not always simple um, uh, but it's uh, fundamentally um, uh, straightforward it's just the number of species that are there that's all there is to it beta diversity is much more complicated so what is the beta diversity of this study so one way of doing that and there are an infinite number of ways to calculate beta diversity there is no single way to do it but one way we could start thinking about it is by saying that sample one and sample two share two species sample two and sample three share only one species the species h uh, that is found in all the samples this is the only species that is found in both sample two and sample three and then the beta diversity of sample one and sample three, comparing one to three, is four, because there are four species, one, two, three, four, that are found in both sample one and sample three. Right? So with beta diversity, we're looking at the distribution of the species across the samples, and then comparing samples to each other based on their composition of species. It's a, it's a comparative statistic. It's not just a counting statistic. It's also a statistic that is attempting to represent the meaningful ecological um, parameters of the system that we are studying. So um, here we're just doing presence and absence. Often we're not dealing with just presence and absence, but we're dealing with abundance. So here is essentially the same example, except now instead of presence and absence, we're representing the abundance the abundances of the species in the different samples. So now instead of just noting that species A is present in one and three, we're noting that it's much more abundant. We counted it 5,000 times in sample three, and we counted it occurring 23 times in sample one. Again, you can think of this exactly like bird species. If you go out, you not only say, yes, I found the species, you write how many individuals of that species did you see there? Did you see a whole flock of ravens or did you just see one raven, right? We can do the same thing with microbes by counting how many times their DNA sequences occur in the sequencing studies. Now the beta diversity we can use to um, compare these samples to each other, not only by presence absence, but by taking into account that species A is much more abundant in sample three than sample one. And that is informative. We can include that in our beta diversity study. How do you do that is not straightforward. And there are, um, hundreds of different calculations out there and different models of of how you would go about calculating the beta diversity of this and that's not something that i'm going to expect you to do but it is something that we will talk about we will note that in this paper they did it this way in this paper they did it a different way or in this paper they did it three different ways and got three different answers right so for now i just want to acknowledge that this is where it gets complicated and also where it gets fun um it's where um things can get interesting and we can talk about like what is important for understanding the ecology of a, of a system, right? Um, yeah, so just a little bit more about how this works. I'm almost done here. And this is getting closer to how you will actually interact with it in a paper. Um, everything I've talked about so far is kind of like the basic idea that you won't necessarily see represented in the figure of a published paper. But here is how you actually get to a figure that you'd put in a paper. So here is our species abundance table, the number of times each species occurs in a sample. And you would convert that into a dissimilarity matrix, where now each of these numbers represents the similarity between one of the samples to another. So this could be something like saying that sample one and sample two have 0.24 dissimilarity. So they have 24% dissimilarity, which is the same thing as saying 76% similarity. So a lower number means they are more similar to each other. Um, and a higher number means they are more dissimilar, which means they are not as similar, right? Um, if, if that was confusing to you, don't worry. The important point is that you then convert this table, and often as a student running your computer program, you never actually really look at this table. What you look at is a figure that represents these similarities and dissimilarities in some kind of graphical format. So here is a real example of a figure I made using exactly this process of samples I collected from my hydrothermal vent system. Um, these funny names are the names of the chimneys that we assigned to the hydrothermal chimneys on the seafloor. And each of these dots is one sample that we collected and sequenced the 16S genes from. And um, samples that appear closer to each other have lower similarities or higher similarities to each other. 
and samples that are very far from each other have very high dissimilarity or low similarity. So um, the samples from our sombrero chimney are very different from the samples from our marker C or from our beehive chimney. But the samples from the sombrero chimney, those 16S sequences are basically the same 16S sequences and in the same abundances as we found in uh, Calypso, IMAX, and Poseidon camel humps. Right. Um, I'll talk more about this particular project in a later time, but for now, this is just to say that if you see a, a, a figure like this, and these are called multi-dimensional scaling plots or ordination plots, if you see a figure like this, I want you to know that they made that figure by generating some kind of a matrix of comparisons which came from counting species. Now, this um, lecture is probably the most confusing, the most complicated certainly the most technically rich lecture I am ever going to give in this class. Every other lecture in this class I'm going to give is about <clears throat> ecosystems and microbes with nice pictures and talking about how things really work. Um, this is going to be really the only math I ever use in the whole course and the only time I really dig deep into a technical detail. And I'm doing it now because it will help you for reading all the papers and so I want to do it at the beginning of the course. But please don't be scared by it. We'll talk about it in class. If you have questions, I will help you with them. And even if you never completely understand how this works, and I don't even completely understand how this works because it's actually really complicated, it's okay. You can still get through the course. Okay, thanks for listening to this lecture. I will see you in class to talk about it more.